Hello, hello, friends. Pastor Sam with a devotion from Matthew 22. We are going to today have some of Jesus' uh, detractors. I don't like calling them opponents. Some of Jesus' detractors asking him trick questions. And in typical Jesus fashion, he will not answer the trick question, but he will touch on, address what is at the heart of even the trick question. And then he'll have a question for them, which of course they will not be able to answer. There we go. I summed up the entire devotion. Off you go or stay tuned. We'll get into it in more detail. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are going to read Matthew 22, uh, 23 through 46. The same day Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So too the second and the third down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, Whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, he asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Now if you tuned in to uh, Tuesday's devotion, we were talking about the Pharisees interrupting Jesus and asking him a question, and then, I'm not going to go into these uh, first half, but um, again, Jesus spoke to them. So this, uh, this parable continues kind of on the heels of what we talked about last time. Then we have a little bit of uh, time delay, right? Pharisees go and plot and probably come to him um, the next day, right? Again, yesterday's or Tuesday's devotion probably happened like on Monday or so. So this then is happening on the Tuesday of Holy Week. And again, by Friday, Jesus is obviously dead. So the um, confrontational nature of the Pharisees is growing higher and higher until finally, um, a few days from when this reading occurs, they are able to put him to death. But anyway, getting into our reading... We've got some trick questions. And uh, the Sadducees, right, and now we, we get this little bit of um, outside information. Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, are trying to kind of pr pr prove to Jesus the absurdity of the resurrection by, this, by concocting this um, example, which probably did occur. Right at some point in history, maybe not seven uh, brothers, but I'm sure there was a man and a wife who got married and didn't have kids, and then the man died, and so his brother uh, married her, and they didn't have kids, and and I don't know how many times it would have happened, but I'm sure that this example had occurred, 
at some point in the history of the earth so so it is kind of a it's a reasonable example in that respect however and we'll get to that when we get to Jesus' response, it's just entirely wrong-headed, right? The, the question seems okay, except that it's clear wrong, <laughs> right? Which uh, is a good way to answer a question. Anyway, uh, so what, hap what would happen in the Old Testament especially? Again, there was no welfare, there was no WIC, there were no food stamps, there was no... Um, social security there was no unemployment right we have all of these kind of programs built up to help take care of people when they're in need they didn't have any of that stuff so if you're if you were a lady and your husband died you could basically beg on the streets or go live with uh, your husband's brother those were your options so ladies uh even fellas this this is a pretty clear choice to be made um, go beg on the streets or go live with your brother-in-law, basically. You, you could see the attraction of um, this example, right? There, there, and that was welfare. That was WIC. That was unemployment. That was uh, rental assistance. That was all of these things that we have now was contained in that um, command, custom, tradition of caring for the family of your, like, your relatives, right? Caring for kind of your extended family, not just letting them be off on their own, but taking them into your house and providing for them. That that was the custom. And so uh, this, uh, w without, without knowing that, this can seem sort of strange. Like they're just kind of passing this woman around and um, can, can even seem to kind of border on prostitution, right? It's not, because again, I, that that kind of thinking comes when you're looking at it in today's world and the world back then was very very different than today's world and so this was really how widows especially were cared for they would go into they would live with their brother-in-law basically is what would happen that's how they were cared for so what the the content of this question yeah it is is a reasonable question to have except of course so then let's get let's get down to their actual question before we talk about um, Jesus response in the resurrection whose wife will she be pausing to drink for dramatic effect oh this is maybe my favorite answer of Jesus you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God boom like, oh man, I don't think he's ever put anybody to shame like that. <laughs> Every part of that is just beautiful, right? You're wrong. Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. You bleeping idiot. <laughs> My words, not our Lord's words. Our Lord is much more compassionate uh, than I. But um, I just love it. Like, okay, here we go. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And uh, we to this day still have this, right? A marriage is uh, valid until one of the people dies, at which point the marriage is broken. And even Paul calls upon this fact in, I believe it's in Romans. No, um... Ephesians or something like that. The law was our guardian. No. How was it? Shoot, I can't even think of it. Um, basically, the law, we were married to the law, but then Jesus put the law to death, so we were widowed, and then we could be married to Jesus. That's like a super rough paraphrase of what Paul says. And I kind of think it's in Romans. I don't know. I could be totally wrong about that. But anyway, my point is, <laughs> he appeals, Paul appeals to the fact that after death, a marriage is, like, done. There, there is no more husband and wife after death has occurred. There, there is a widow or a widower, but um, she is no longer, or he, the, the, the remaining spouse, is no longer married in that sense. And uh, where Paul takes this is that the marriage vows 
are no longer binding. And he uses it in the example for like, we were married to the law, but then the law died. Um, Jesus put the law to death. And so our, our marriage vows and our need to, to, be, to cling to the law is gone. And so we no longer have to be faithful to the law. We can instead be faithful to Jesus Christ. Ooh, super sidetrack. But uh, anyway, our Lord says in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So each person who has died has been released from the, the vows that they took in marriage. And so in the resurrection, we don't have this like need to pair people up as husband and wife that um i'm gonna i'm gonna say this maybe carefully that relationship uh that will not be the primary relationship between people that's how i want to say that rather um the relationship of brother and sister in christ will be the primary relationship and and children of god that will be our primary means of relating to one another is as brother and sister. And so there, there will be neither marriage, there will be neither marrying nor being given in marriage in the resurrection. So first of all, Sadducees, your question is entirely wrongheaded um, because you do not know the scriptures. And uh, to, to, to go even further and, and to, to again, prove to you who tried to prove to me there is no resurrection i'm going to prove to you that there is because how does god call himself i am the god of abraham and the god of isaac and the god of jacob he is god of living actual real people he is not god of dead people who stay dead he is god of real actual alive people you and me And this was an astonishing teaching. Okay, now I love this. Verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Okay. <laughs> okay, our, our, well, I don't know how Pharisees and Sadducees thought about one another. Maybe they hated each other. Maybe they did. I don't know. They're like, Jesus just silenced this group of really smart people. But where? even smarter. So we're going to get together and we're going to ask him a question that's going to put him to shame. All right? That's 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 kind of what's going on here. And and you can see already uh how poorly this is going to go. So anyway, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Which one? Which one is the if we got a whole lot of law to think about, which is the greatest one? Now, I don't know why this is a hard question. I don't get it. This one seems pretty straightforward. I mean, our Sunday schoolers could figure this out. So I don't get this. I don't understand why this is a question to test him. That's okay. Maybe 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 I'm just really smart and our Sunday schoolers are just really smart. Maybe this Pharisee was really dumb. I don't know. I I, I don't understand why this is a hard question. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Like, what's the most important thing? Love God. Our Sunday schoolers could tell you that. Come on. I, I, I don't see why this... I, I don't know why this is a trick question. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Like, number two, love God, love other people. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm overlooking something. This seems pretty straightforward. Like, this is a lot easier than this. This answer requires some pretty serious knowledge about the inner workings of God. This answer is like, come on, this is like one of the first things we learn um, as Christians. I don't know. Either way, maybe we're just really smart now. Who knows? Okay. So, uh, trick question one answered... I guess trick question two, still answered by Jesus. He has a question to ask them. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son 
is he? And they say the son of David, which is not a wrong answer, by the way. And um, does Jesus appeal to himself as the son of David? That is a good question. I don't know if he does. The Messiah is consistently called the son of David. And so Jesus, by extension, would be obviously the son of David. But I don't know if he calls himself that. That is an interesting point. Either way, um, they answer his question, and, and they fell into the trap. If only Admiral Akbar were here to advise them on the answering of questions. Anyway, Jesus says, How is it then that David, I'm in a mood right now, in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, this is the most quoted passage in the Bible. And what I mean by that is, within the New Testament, they will quote the Old Testament. And this, this, is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. So this is apparently a very important verse. If, if we hear and understand and appreciate the New Testament authors, this verse comes up with striking frequency. And here, even our Lord is bringing it up. So this passage, this verse, is incredibly important. Because, because, um, the people were waiting for the son of David. And they were waiting for perhaps a successor to David. Um, but, but to varying levels of of greatness it, it, c compared to David, right? So maybe David, like, had greatness, and maybe the son of David would be a little bit, I gotta look over and see, a little bit lower, maybe a little bit greater, but not, like, loads greater, but probably about David's great. They were looking for another David. But, Jesus says, David calls him Lord. So even that great, this was my David hand, even that great guy, King David, that you all loved so much, calls the Christ Lord. So it's like, it's like off the scales. The, the, the Christ is so much greater than David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So the Christ, the Messiah, is much, much greater, right? If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Because uh, think about like the father-son relationship. The son is accountable to the father. Um, I won't say the son is less than the father. I don't know if that's fair to say. Um, but, but the father holds, perhaps we'll say some authority over the son, um, a degree of the, the son should respect show respect to his father is maybe the way to say it. And, and so there's, there's um, the son will, will maybe do things th the way that the father wants as opposed to the way that perhaps he wants or will defer to the father's knowledge or wisdom or experience or whatever. Um, but, but in the case of David and Jesus, there's not that same thing where Jesus kind of defers to David. Instead, Jesus is like, showing the new way and doing things the new and better way compared to David. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. So we're all done with these trick questions, whether they be very difficult or strikingly easy trick questions, they were all done. Jesus is putting opponents to shame, whereas they had tried to put him to shame. Because Jesus is actually a very smart person, probably the smartest person. So if you're going to bring a trick question, you better make it a good one. Anyway, um, Jesus points us in the right direction, kind of hinting the question about the resurrection, showing us where not only his life is headed, because again, in less than a week, he will have died and risen from the dead, but then showing us that hope that we have that in the resurrection, um, things are going to be good for us. And that's kind of where we're headed, 
Matthew 23 and 24 and 25. Especially, we're starting to get at those end time things. And now, now that, oh, I don't have this up anymore. Now that the opponents, the detractors, I don't like the word opponents, are not going to ask him any more questions, it's time for Jesus to share with us the things that he wants. So we'll be getting into that on Saturday and then again next week looking at it. So come back for all of those. But first, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for the knowledge that you have and for sharing it with us that we can also know God and know you and that we can follow you in the path to eternal life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Again, I want to thank you for joining me on these devotions. I, I really do um, appreciate each time that you tune in and I hope that you continue to learn more about God and more about what it means to follow him. So I will see you next time. God's peace be with you.